three, two. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon and welcome to our weekly media briefing and public health update with Montgomery County Executive Mark Elridge. I'm Lorna Vigili, Hispanic Public Information Officer, and joining us today is Dr. Keisha Davis, the county's health officer, as well as Dr. Nina Ashford, Chief of Public Health Services, Mr. Sean O'Donnell, Acting Deputy Chief of Public Health Services, Dr. Earl Stoddard, who is Assistant Chief Administrative Officer, and we have two special guests this afternoon. Dr. Brad Marin, the Court Director for University of Maryland Institute of Health Computing, and Dr. Jermaine F. Williams, President of Montgomery College. Thank you everybody for joining us. Good afternoon to you, Mr. County Executive. Welcome. Good, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for uh, joining us today. So uh, six years ago, when Montgomery County lost its bid for Amazon's second headquarters, HQ, um, I realized that the winning bidders won largely because of the access to a talented workforce and training and graduate level research and uh, other things that were available in Virginia at the time and that um, we actually outbid them. And it turned out that money was not the most important thing, but talent and access to transit were more important. Upon taking office um, and even despite the distraction of the pandemic, we've maintained a focus on the need for graduate level research, workforce training, more lab space and better transportation in the county. Lab space is particularly notable because growth in lab space had actually come to a halt by, 19, by 2018. And when I came to office, um, we made changes that have now led to over 5 million square feet of lab space, either completed construction or in the process of happening. So that's a, an incredibly large growth in lab space over the last four years. And it's important for Montgomery County's, you know, bio future. This week, I have updates on all three fronts um, with an update from our partners at the University of Maryland, the, Universe, the Institute for Health Computing in North Bethesda, the opening of Montgomery College's East County Education Center, which is stage one of what's going to be a new college campus, and also news about an unprecedented partnership with WMATA that's going to help mitigate delays due to the summer track work on the red line on the east side of the county. So I'm going to start with uh, the updates on the Maryland uh, University of Maryland Institute for Health Computing. Uh, I've been working on the Institute for Health Computing since taking office at the end of 2018. Through multiple conversations and research, we facilitated the next step in the program, which is a partnership between the county and the University of Maryland. I got to visit their offices this week, and as you can see from this picture, um, I was able to receive a demonstration in their augmented reality. I also had an amazing presentation from them about what kind of work they're gonna be doing there at the center. Montgomery County is the heart of the third largest bio life sciences cluster in the nation, just behind the Bay Area and Boston. However, we're the only top rated area without a graduate level research facility serving the needs of our local companies until now. The IHC leverages our strengths and promises to officer, offer an amazing opportunity for research and collaboration with the private sector. And just a few weeks ago, the General Assembly ended its 2024 session with significant funding for IHC. I want to thank the Montgomery County State Delegation for the $6 million in annual spending costs and $3 million in capital costs from the recently ended a General Assembly session. Montgomery County is already committed to an initial investment of about $40 million in the Institute, and the federal government has invested about $3 million. This partnership with the university is going to lead to healthcare innovations and help sustain investment in the life sciences here in Montgomery County. We are aiming to become um, the Silicon Valley of health computing, which is how the folks at IHC refer to their project. Just this morning, I was with program leaders at BizNow's Mid-Atlantic Life Sciences Biotech Summit in Rockville, and we were discussing its future and what it means for Montgomery County and the world. Now I'm going to be very excited to have Dr. Brad Moran um, join me to talk with you about IHC and what's going on there since our last update. So welcome, Brad. Thank you very much uh, for having me and for all the support. It's been a, a great pleasure getting to know you and the county, so I appreciate that very much. Would you like me to talk a little bit about yeah. the Institute? Okay. So, yeah. okay. Um, 
by way of introduction to the rest of the group, uh, my name's Brad Marin. I'm a I'm a cardiologist and a scientist uh, for the last two decades, and uh, I had the opportunity of coming to uh, Montgomery County as of May 1st to help co-direct the new University of Maryland Institute for Health Computing, which is a really uh, fantastic uh, opportunity to leverage data and computational science for improving uh, life sciences, the biotech uh, sector, and importantly, uh, outcomes for patients across the state of Maryland. We've seen incredible interest in the Institute, uh, both from a local, regional, state, national, and even international uh, level. We've had visitors uh, from Europe uh, come to visit us and see the Institute for Health Computing now on site uh, in North Bethesda. So the Institute is assembled through six centers that really uh, emphasize cutting edge science in the context of health and human disease. Those centers are in artificial intelligence, bioinformatics, which is the study of integrating mathematics to understanding uh, different elements of science, therapeutic target discovery, population and community health, real-world data and adaptive clinical trials, and immersive reality. And those six centers really conspire to create uh, an environment that is uh, wide in its capacity to build novel innovations that are commercializable, but also have uh, the power to impact large segments of our population, particularly through the important lens of health equity, which is a major focus for every project that we contemplate at the Institute. I'll also say that uh, it's, it's no trivial advantage to be in Montgomery County uh, by virtue of proximity to the National Institutes of Health, uh, the National uh, Cancer Institute, uh, the Federal, the Food and Drug Administration, NIST, and some of the other major federal stakeholders uh, that really establish policy and can and are already serving as formal partners to our larger mission to maximize our impact and to bring as much positive attention uh, to our institute, but also to the county as we can. Thank you, Dr. Marin. Members of the media, uh, do you have any questions uh, for Dr. Marin and or the county executive related to this topic at this moment? Please raise your hand and we'll call on you. We'll give you a couple of seconds. Any questions? No questions for Dr. Marr this afternoon? Thank you for joining us. Thank you for being here, Mr. County Executive. Do you wanna say goodbye to Dr. Marr before we continue yes. with other topics? Yes, thank you. And really good, really good seeing you this morning and having a chance to talk with you yesterday as well. So uh, thank you as always. I appreciate your time and, and thanks again for the support. I'm always available to answer questions offline as well. Okay, take care. Thank you. Have a great right. afternoon. So in the next uh, set of news this last weekend, um, doors opened at the New Montgomery College East County Education Center on April 1st. This past Saturday, we celebrated it with a grand opening celebration. It was particularly exciting for me because this is another of the projects I was determined to get done from day one as county executive. It had been a long discussed idea that there should be another campus in Montgomery College, but in 2018, there was no plans to move it forward. Uh, we worked with the college and you know, were emphatic with them that we really wanted this to happen and we'd support it. And my team committed to opening a campus on the East County. This is a major milestone toward having a permanent campus in East County. Um, they are working with a major developer, developer over there, and it's quite possible that the college could wind up on a campus in an incredibly new development in Montgomery County. So lots of good things are happening, and we we're very excited about this. We knew for a long time that residents in East County needed easier access to community colleges in the county and also to workforce training, and the demand is definitely there. The classes they opened up quickly filled. Um, they were already filled, which was really impressive in the first month. High school students in that region of Montgomery County will also be able to take advantage of the campus the way other high school students are able to take advantage of the other MC campuses in the county. 
this is close to those schools and it will help them get the opportunity to take um, credit programs over at the college. Uh, opening this branch is also an important part of our workforce development training and uh, helping to connect students with employers who need their talents. So Montgomery College has done a good job of putting together links between their classes and, and business and industry uh, that need the talent that the college is able to produce. Uh, for example, I toured their health training classroom, which is being supported by Washington Venice, around the corner from the new Washington Venice Hospital. And uh, the hospital is in need of a more well-trained staff. That's true for, not just for Venice, but also for the other hospitals in the county. This project is one more example of working uh, to do in the East County, which includes Burtonsville, the work we're doing in the East County, which includes Burtonsville Crossing, White Oak Town Center, and the Hillendale Gateway Project, along with improvements to the flash bus service on 29. All three of the commercial projects were stalled when I came into office, but after I got personally involved in these, I was able to figure out and work with our staff to get solutions to the problem and make sure they move forward. Viva Waco has a new partner that is driving development, and I'm optimistic that visible progress will soon become apparent. And we're working on plans to turn US 29 flash bus into real bus rapid transit with actual dedicated lanes. So it doesn't have to drive in mixed traffic, particularly below New Hampshire Avenue. It's great to see this part of the county getting the attention that's long deserved. I hear from residents all the time about how happy they are to see things uh, finally happening over there. And we, we I recognize why they're happy. It's a good thing. At this time, I'd like to welcome Montgomery College President Jermaine Williams. He's here to talk about the expansion and what you can expect at the East County Education Center now, this summer, and in the fall. So, hello, Dr. Williams, and it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. County Executive. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to share a little bit, and thank you for, thank you for, for your support uh, with this uh, immense initiative that is another step forward, another step forward to empowering our workforce, as you said, and ensuring diversity and opportunity and, and nurturing an ecosystem in which business and education work hand in hand. It was a beautiful day on Saturday when, when we had a ribbon cutting just a few days ago, as you, as you mentioned, and as you also mentioned, years of planning, investment, and collaboration helped to produce the fantastic 55,000 square foot standalone facility that is now the East County Education Center. And together, um, I know I stand on the shoulders of, of giants and again, appreciative of, of your support. Together, we've created a new pathway to educational opportunity for students we serve and the residents we seek to serve, uh, a pathway to economic independence for community members, a pathway to strengthening local businesses and, and to community impact. And as you shared, County Executive, when we talk about community impact, we're talking about equitable opportunities to access education and training that prepare residents to earn family sustaining wages, economic growth via a sustainable agile workforce that fuels current and future businesses. We're also talking about people investing time and energy to the public good, which speaks to the social transformation that, that, that we seek. And now with the East County Education Center, ECEC, East County residents can, they can prepare uh, in this wonderful buildings, all purpose classrooms, flex spaces, library and, and nursing labs. And as you mentioned, our partners at um, Advances, specifically at White Oak, um, you know, are, are very excited about that, you know, knowing the number of new nurses and health professionals that we can educate and train. And for those of us who, who engage in IT, which is, I know all of us, uh, and you mentioned this is our full enrollment in our IT short-term training programs through, through TechMap. So this is just a fantastic opportunity, classes, are also going to include clinical medical assistance, math, writing, citizenship, wiring, and electricity. Um, that last one will be taught in Spanish. So this is providing a wealth of opportunity. And again, appreciative, so deeply thankful for, for your support and your continued support, as you mentioned. Uh, this is a great leap forward and we have more to accomplish, right? We are planning our fourth Montgomery College campus in the East County, and, and we look forward to you continuing to support us, Mr. County Executive. So um, thank you again for the opportunity, and we're just, just very excited about this. Thank you, Preston, Dr. Williams. Uh, members of the media, any questions now regarding the East County Education Center? 
for Dr. Williams and or the county executive. Please raise your hand if you have any questions. No questions regarding Montgomery College? Going once, twice, I guess not. Thank you, Dr. Williams, for joining us this afternoon. You can remain on the call or you can part. I'm sure you're busy. <laughs> yeah, thank you again. And it was a beautiful day when we opened it up. And I, I had a really, I really enjoyed the tour I got. Um, on to other news. Uh, we're talking, we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, cooperation between Maryland DOT and WMATA and our DOT department to try to conge ease the congestion that's going to be tied to the red line shutdown. In, in case you've missed this news, uh, working on the purple line is going to necessitate a three-month shutdown of the red line um, on the East County side, basically Tacoma Park to Glenmont. And uh, it, there's also necessary red line work being done. So the WMATA is taking advantage of the shutdown to try to more quickly get some of the work they have to do uh, to make upgrades and improvements on the red line side of the, of the project. So it's gonna be closed for about three months. And yesterday I enjoyed state, and I joined state and local rep representatives um, from the transportation departments for an update on WMATA's red line plans. Um, on June 1st, when they close, uh, like I said, it'll be the Glenmont, Wheaton, Forestland, Tacoma, and Silver Spring stations. Tacoma will reopen after one month, but the other stations are gonna remain closed until September 1st, uh, while, the, while the work is done. To allow the temporary shuttle buses to move quickly on the roads at, during this time, the State Highway Administration is gonna allow seven and a half miles of bus lanes only on Georgia Avenue and adjust the signal timing in the area. Uh, the goal is that you know, there are literally thousands of people who take that train in every morning to go to work and every evening to come home from work. And the thought of, those thousands of people being reduced to using their cars would turn George Avenue into a pretty colossal mess. Uh, so we're gonna be putting intense shuttle service into that corridor to help make sure that people otherwise would be using rapid transit can get a bus ride. The buses will be in a bus only lane, so they won't be in mixed traffic and there will be a signal adjustments also to help the buses move more quickly along the route. So we think we can provide a beneficial solution. We also think it, we're going to be monitoring, and WMATA said they'll be monitoring how the system performs. And if there are problems during the month, they'll look to make improvements on the fly uh, to make sure that they can take care of everything that they can take care of um, as we go through this three-month period. And we'll look to the future to see what we learned from this little experiment about our road capacity and uh, what we can do with transit. Last month, the council and I wrote WMATA and, and the state, and we asked them for these kinds of adjustments, and we were very appreciative for their response. This was very quick. Some people might say record response for the state, and they were very cooperative, and it was, very, um, it was a very good celebration we had because all of us were on the same page, um, both in helping get this thing done and get it done on time, but also looking to cooperate as we move forward. I'm hopeful the changes will help residents who are going to be impacted by the closures, uh, but also demonstrate how bus only lanes can actually work successfully. So if you want more information, you can visit Montgomery County Department of Transportation. The website is montgomerycountymd.gov slash DOT to share, um, to get the information about these alternatives and um, give you a place to contact us if you have any questions about what you're seeing. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our administrative staff for any updates they have. Then we'll take questions from the media. Thank you, Mr. Connie, Executive. Mr. O'Donnell, Dr. Ashford, Dr. Davis, any uh, uh, public health updates? None for me, thank you. No, no updates. Dr. Satter? Yeah, I just wanted to par uh, uh, call out some of our partners who uh, uh, actually faith-based organizations who held a gun buyback uh, in Germantown over the last weekend. And I did get a report this morning of, of sort of the what we got back to, to the sheriff's office there. 
and wanted to share that. So there were 50 handguns, 28 rifles, 19 shotguns, two what are described as machine guns, and eight uh, PMFs or, or privately manufactured firearms, ghost guns. Uh, they also got several other kinds of weapons, stun guns, a BB gun, a crossbow, and large amounts of ammunition that were turned in for destruction. And so it was a was a well-received event in the Germantown area. And so I want to thank those faith-based partners from the Gun Violence Prevention Network for doing it, as well as the state's attorney's office and sheriff's office for assisting. And uh, I believe Montgomery County Police Department was there to help to keep traffic moving as well. So it was a good event and it was seen very productive and obviously got more firearms off the street. Which were which could be utilized either for for crime, but also for suicide as well. So those are that's an important pro program to do. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stoddard. Members of the media, we're going to open it up right now for questions and, and answers. If you have any questions for the officials this afternoon, please raise your hand. There is uh, Heather Curtis with WMAL Radio. Good afternoon, Heather. Good afternoon. Um, so the first question is uh, for you, Mr. Elrich. A, a mom today sent us a picture. Her daughter goes to BCC, and she said that in the bathroom, the picture had words in the bathroom, and it somebody had scrawled Free Palestine on the wall. And she and her family are Jewish, and she said her daughter is feeling unsafe. I'm wondering if you're concerned about increased, um, you know, anti-Semitic, anti-Islam incidents happening in schools, especially given what's been happening on college campuses recently? It, it's hard not to be concerned. I mean, the loss of civility is, you know, pretty alarming. Um, it, it doesn't give any of us any comfort uh, to see this happening. And uh, nobody should be subjected to suggestions that uh, you don't belong someplace or you shouldn't be able to live in peace. You know, we've done a lot of work in this county to try to make people feel feel safe. And we're going to continue to do that kind of work. Uh, we're not going to tolerate, you know, behavior that is uh, not conducive to people being able to work with each other and get along. And I hope the school system, you know, this this is in the school and it's on the school system to do things. But we hope they take these kind of incidents seriously. Um, they really has to be a clarity that this is not the kind of behavior that we expect out of our students, nor is it going to be tolerated. And what advice would you have for parents um, who are concerned because, you know, they're of the Jewish faith, they're of the Muslim faith, or just, you know, any, any parents who are concerned about what may or may not happen in schools? You know, it's, it's really hard to give advice. And, you know, I, you know, probably, you know, I grew up with this stuff, particularly the anti-Semitic side of it. So um, I remember, what it felt like when you would get harassed for being Jewish. Uh, I just, uh, I think parents got to comfort their kids. I think we've got to remind ourselves that for, um, for all these incidents, I don't think it necessarily reflects um, the general student body. I mean, it doesn't take very many people to do things that then become major issues. And we begin to think of that, well, this must be everybody, but it's not everybody. Um, and I think we have to keep telling ourselves, this is not everybody, and we need to work to make sure that the people who encourage this um, understand they shouldn't be encouraging. You, I mean, we all know the kids don't get this out of the air. Um, there are forces in their lives that are contributing to these ideas, and uh, it's, um, I think everybody needs to kind of back down and, you know, People have rights to opinions, but opinions shouldn't lead to assaults on other people's sense of safety or well-being. That goes beyond having an opinion. Absolutely. And I have one more question on schools, if I may. Um, on Monday, as you know, there was the you know threats made against Wooten High School, threats made against a number of other schools, and the student with the gun in Clarksburg. Um, are you concerned that some of these may be copycat incidents given the arrest last week of the student from Wooten? And um, does that seem, you know, particularly alarming to you, the timing of these threats after last week and, you know, lots of disturbing information coming out there? I mean, it's hard to say whether anything's triggered by, by that event. Obviously, neither, none of the others appear to be associated with the kind of deliberate planning that was put into, you know, what looked like it could have become a mass shooting. 
Um, I think it's disturbing, but I'm not sure. I'm not going to say it's a copycat or not, because honestly don't know. And we don't have any evidence that, you know, anybody's collected social media posts or somebody's notes where you could look at it and say, well, this person, you know, cited this as, you know, an inspiration and they decided to act on it. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Uh, Jeannie Bexley, Mobile 360, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you so much. My question is for the county executive. Um, I have a budget question for you. I know we're well into the county council deliberating on the budget and what they're going to do about it. I've been talking to a lot of LGBTQ plus advocates in the community that are concerned that the budget as proposed doesn't have enough funding for services for that community. Um, particularly the LGBT or excuse me, the MoCo Pride Center or the creation of a pride of a LGBTQ plus center. I know in the FEMA, the proposed amendment with the FEMA money, there's the five hundred thousand dollar allocation. Cool. I'm not really seeing much else. Um, and today the county council has put out four members of the county council have put out a letter to the other members of the council asking that this be a greater priority in the budget. Kind of what's your response to this? Do you think that the budget as proposed has enough services for the LGBTQ plus community, especially given the OLO report that said the county needs to do more? Um, what kind of what are your thoughts? Well, we were specifically asked to put in money for a pride center, which we specifically did. The only reason it got put in the way it was is that uh, we had money that we weren't allowed to count. I mean, this is this is just a council policy, but there is there is a view that if we don't absolutely have the money in our hands, we shouldn't put it in the budget. We knew we were going to get um, about thirty three million from the federal government in reimbursement. They'd actually told us what our reimbursement was going to be, but we didn't have it in hand when we sent the budget over. So we put it into the supplemental because we knew we were going to have the money. And sure enough, within two weeks, we had the other money. So I hope the council passes it. And, you know, frankly, you know, I hope they take the time to think about, you know, all the items that are additional, because these are all things that people have asked for, including council members like the Pride Center. Uh, there are other projects in there that we know have, you know, real serious importance to the community and, uh, I think, you know, given that this is a, a budget that required no tax increase and is fully funded and that where the county has record levels of reserves, uh, we don't see a justification for taking the position that there's some desperate need to not do these programs. Could you point me beyond that $500,000 allocation? And I'm on the same page with you about the FEMA money. Yeah. Are there in the, you know, I've looked through open budget. I just want to make sure am I missing anything? Is there anything in the operating budget that goes towards, for example, HIV testing, access to gender affirming care, anything like that? I mean, some of our partners, for example, do HIV testing. You know, so when you, because I've, because I've gone and I've volunteered to get tested, you know, when I go to some of these mm -hmm. um, clinics, that's, that's absolutely what they do. And I don't know if there's a specific separate call out for gender affirming care, but I, you know, I could get an answer to you for that. We could uh, talk with our health folks and ask them what they're doing specifically in that space. I, I can actually add to some of this. So okay. Jenny, there was a, there was a supplemental appropriation that was submitted the same day as the budget was. So it's an FY24 supplemental, but supplementals can carry across fiscal years. And that was for the pride center itself for $200,000. And yeah, I um, I actually yeah. wrote an article about that. Yeah. And so having been personally involved in this, I had a conversation with our HHS, uh, Melvin Coffin and Emily Brown from our HIV testing unit, who are, who are big supporters of, of that initiative, and, and asked them to, we need to develop a, in, in light of the OLO report, we need to develop a broader strategy on how to address LGBTQ health moving forward. I know there's some ideas within the HHS, and I know there are ideas some within the council. We need a more synergistic strategy to, to address the underlying issues identified in the OLO report. And so that's something that we had committed to do working over the summer, recognizing that the Pride Center supplemental would carry them for several months while we could actually have this conversation about strategy and identify how the CCI clinic that is funded within the budget would fit into that larger strategy. So, you know, we've had conversations ranging from having an LGBTQ health initiative, like we do our, our, our ethnic health initiatives, but we want to figure out what the best strategy is for the community to address the underlying needs. Um, as Ken Executive said, we're committed to making sure the Montgomery County is welcoming uh, for all, 
and uh, healthcare is a is a core right that individuals should have access to. And so we want to make sure that there is uh, that capability within the uh, within the within the ecosystem of healthcare in Montgomery County. Thank you both. Thank you, Jeannie. Uh, members of the media, any more questions? No more questions for the county officials this afternoon? Oh, Heather, you have your hand up. Go ahead. So I'm wondering, um, you know, Executive, you had talked about uh, all of the increased lab space and trying to make it so that there's a, an increased workforce to work in those labs, et cetera. Um, do you at this point know uh, what percentage of the new lab space is filled? I don't, I can get you that number, but I know they're, they're building because they believe there's a market for it. And when I came into office, they weren't building because they didn't believe there was a market. So I, th I think they're building into what they see as an increased request for uh, lab space. I was in a, one of a new private lab that's opening up in Montgomery County today, earlier. And, you know, they did this on spec, believing that the market's here for that expansion. So we think, you know, we're, we're doing good to get this space built. And it's, you know, if you don't have it when people want it, and then you say, I'll get it a year or two from now, they're go they've already gone someplace else. So it's better to, to build ahead um, so that when people come here, they can find what they want and it helps other people make investments to keep building ahead as well. And I think that's what we're seeing here. Do you know, um, it, uh, are a lot, you talked a while ago about using some of the empty space, um, that we, office space that was created during yeah. the pandemic. Uh, do you know, if, <clears throat> are, has there been success getting labs to convert those empty office spaces into labs? Yeah. So, you know, the Henry Jackson Foundation, which is over in the, uh, uh, where is that? It's by the, it's by the, um, by West, by Westfield in in the park in the business park over there um henry jackson labs are a conversion of an office building to lab space and they're doing more the building i was in today was an office building and they completely gutted out the floors of the building so literally there are no dividing walls unless they were load bearing and everything was clear open spaces and they had put labs in there so the conversion's happening uh, their their facility is incredibly sophisticated. It was uh, a cut above a lot of other facilities I've seen, but it was it's really nice. And uh, they made this investment. They bought the building and then made a very very large investment in upgrading it to lab space. So the, it's already happening. Great, thank you. Thank you, Heather. Members of the media, any more questions? I guess not. We're done for today. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Have a pleasant afternoon. Stay safe, and we'll see you again next time. Thank you all. Bye.